this talk is about um, so I, I've been I've been building software in Python for a little bit over a little bit over ten years from now uh, or ten you know it, it's been a little bit over ten years since I started programming in Python um, about a year and a half into that process so this was at the end of 2009 I, I started to get involved with the open source world so I was working at, in a financial firm we decided to open source the library that was um, just then be began to be known as pandas and at that time it was a really small project pandas has become a really big project and most of the development of pandas has happened since after after it was initially after it was initially open source, um, at that time, I didn't know very much about what it meant to build open source software. I didn't know about building communities, or you know how to how to make decisions in public. Uh, so over the over the you know the last eight or nine years, I've been learning a great deal about all of the um, good things and, and bad things about um, building open source projects. And as time has gone on, those um, challenges have, have evolved, uh, particularly as um, things going on in the world of business and the business's relationship with open source has changed uh, a great deal in the, last, in the last decade. So I guess the subtitle for this talk would be uh, Community-Led Open Source and, and You. And I will explain what I mean by community-led uh, led open source and, and why you should uh, you know, n know it and how to distinguish different kinds of, of open source projects uh, and, and how, uh, you know, sort of think about them and, and talk about them with, with, with each other. So things in the open source world have, uh, have changed a lot in the last, in the last 10 years. So uh, GitHub was started in 2008. So, you know, now when you look at how projects are built, on, on the internet, it's hard to imagine life without GitHub, right? So, you know, uh, the Python programming language is, is on GitHub. Uh, Pandas is on GitHub. You know, there's, there's, so, many, there's so many projects there. Uh, and I, I don't know for, for a fact, but I would guess that, you know, more than 50%, um, 50, probably more than 50% of open source development now is either directly or indirectly being carried out uh, on GitHub, which is a huge deal. And so GitHub has been really important in making it easier for um, easier for people to to collaborate, easier for people to come together and figure out how to uh, how how to solve how to solve problems. Around ten years ago, we also saw some other very important uh, open source projects uh, get off the ground. We had the uh, Apache Hadoop project started in in two thousand six at, at Yahoo and kicked off a decade of development of projects for doing dealing with big data um, you know there have been many important projects that that have um, that have you know didn't exist 10 years ago or 12 or 12 years ago and open source has been particularly important in, in you know the world you know the world that I'm in which is the which is the data science world now obviously there's many other um, parts of technology and programming that have experienced great change um, but you know, data science wasn't even uh, a term uh, a decade ago. We used to call it statistics or uh, statistical computing. Um, and so, sometime in the intervening years, um, you know, data science came about, and now it's become one of the important, one of the most important uh, job functions in many uh, in many modern businesses. And open source has played an imp a really important role in enabling people to to learn about tools for doing data science to be able to educate themselves to, to obtain the tools uh, and become uh, become productive so one question would be is open source a, a cause of all of this progress in in data science and, and other areas or or is it is it an, an effect so did having all of these open source projects you know, help spawn the, the field of data science, or did, did was open source a consequence um, of the growth of the field? And um, really, it's I, I I feel it's a it's a complicated answer, um, and I think they they needed to co-develop. So 
um, if you think about how to you know how to build complex projects for solving difficult difficult problems, um, having projects be open source makes the collaboration um, process a great deal more more productive because if somebody builds some soft some code to solve part of the problem, you can take that code and reuse it more easily to build uh, to build new projects either by forking a code base or or building on an existing code base if if the software was closed source that kind of code reuse and collaboration uh, you know would wouldn't happen so you know you can think about it as you know what I like to say is the best code is the code that you don't have to write um, so if you can if you can avoid reinventing the wheel then um, then you can spend your time uh, solving uh, solving other solving other problems um, Another factor in the development of open source is all of the, you know, I don't know whether we're on, we're on like web 3.0 or, or what we're calling it now, but, you know, the rise of, um, you know, the rise of big data and, and social media in the last 10 years where we have um, every, you know, every website and, and, every, mo and, and every mobile app um, is now finally instrumented with data collection. So, you know, any action that you take on the internet is being logged and, and stored in a Hadoop cluster or in S3 or, or someplace, uh, someplace in the cloud. And so not only is all of, is massive amounts of, of data being collected that was not, that we were not able to collect in the past or there really wasn't, wasn't a place to collect it, um, but then it's not enough to, to collect all of that data we need to create uh, systems and tools to manage it and, and analyze it. And if you think about all of the biggest, you know, tech companies in the world that are, are collecting and profiting off all of this data, they needed to scale uh, their ability to analyze that data much faster than any commercial software vendor could respond um, to their needs. And it happened to be that many of these companies, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, you know, Microsoft and so forth, um, they, they believed that building the software as open source would help them make progress help them make progress faster. Another factor that I think has influenced uh, the push towards open source is uh, the licen licensing models related to, related to cloud computing. So that, that's one of the biggest things that's happened you know, in the last decade is the development of you know, infrastructure as a service like Amazon Web Services, Google, Google Cloud Platform. So you know, it used to be you know, let's say you wanted to do some data analysis, you would buy um, a MATLAB license or, or a SAS license. Um, so now an individual data scientist might, you know, one day maybe they're using one machine and the next day they're spinning up a thousand machines on AWS to, to run some, some analysis. So if, whenever you wanted to scale up your analysis, if you needed to call up your software vendor and negotiate uh, more software licenses to be able to do that. That would that would create a big big problem for you. So, increasingly, you know this this uh, this idea that the software should be free and and it should be easy to deploy and install it anywhere um, has been I think really driven by you know the cloud cloud model of being able to elastically scale up and scale down your uh, your computing. Another factor has been um, reproducibility issues in, in science and um, projects like IPython and Jupyter have, um, have spent a lot of time talking about uh, reproducible research and uh, you know, there have been in a lot of high profile cases where people have made mistakes in Excel spreadsheets and doing, uh, in, in doing research or uh, they, you, you might publish an important, might publish an important research result, but um, the data is not made available for scrutiny, or the the code that they wrote is is not made available. And so there've been, um, I don't, I don't have any to cite, but you know there've been many cases that you can you can look up around uh, problems reproducing research results or you know errors that were that were found in uh, in in the analysis. Um, you know whether it's you know uh, you know deliberate kind of uh, deliber deliberate emissions of uh, you know negative results or you know, kind of other kinds of, of science science problems. So you know increasingly there there's I mean it hasn't quite happened yet but you know I think in the future 
we are we are on our way towards a world where, uh, along with scientific research papers, there will also be the expectation that you can provide, um, you know, a Docker file or a Jupyter notebook or some other way for others to see the complete uh, lineage of, of your analysis, so that they can look at all of the steps you took, all of the data pre-processing, data cleaning that you did. Um, so they can understand all the, the, the decisions that you made in producing uh, producing your your research, and having the software be open source is an important part of that because it's not enough to be able to see the code. Uh, one also needs to be able to see how the software is implemented um, to to fully understand you know top to bottom how how the science was was produced. So one, you know, one major theme, um, you know, the biggest, you know, the biggest and most successful, maybe not the biggest, but the most successful open source project of of our lifetimes is is definitely Linux, um, and you know, it, making Linux work in an enterprise setting, you know, turned out to be a a pretty, uh, you know, pretty difficult problem, and it spawned, you know. Really, one of the, the most successful open source businesses, which is which is Red Hat, and there have been uh, a number of other businesses started uh, around Linux, and and nowadays there uh, there are many companies which are working to um, you know to make a business out of building or providing support for uh, open source software uh, in an enterprise setting, but this is also uh, created complications because in many spheres there is the expectation. That the software is open source, you know, particularly in the data science in the data science world, um, a lot of people won't use software if it isn't open source because they want to look at the implementation to understand uh, exactly you know all of the math and, and everything that, that goes into how the how the software works. Um, but at the same time, you have all of these free software projects, and often the work that open source communities do is not enough to meet the needs of, of enterprises. So things that often fall by the wayside are, uh, you know, security and, and auditing issues, um, you know, integration with, you know, uh, data systems or other, other systems which you really only encounter in large, uh, in large enterprises. And so, you know, f you know, from my perspective, having worked in many open source projects, we often don't really see what it's like to be inside, you know, a big company which has, you know, very complex, uh, uh, complex needs, and so it's hard for the open source community to respond to to the needs of big companies that are that want to adopt and use uh, and use the software. So this creates a, a bit of a problem in that companies are uh, people are creating startups and companies to fill in the gaps that. Um, for, for what enterprises and, and, and companies need to make open source work for them. Um, and sometimes it's difficult for those companies to invest back in, in the underlying uh, open source projects. And so there's always this tension between doing things to make money and making the, the software and the community strong. So this gets to one of the, the, the main points of, of this talk that I, that I want to uh, spend some time on, which is, you know, where does all of this software come from? And, you know, when I talk to people, especially when I talk to talk to big companies, they don't, uh, a lot of folks don't don't spend very much time thinking about how the software was produced. I think there's this, this idea of, of open source developers, you know, like, you know, hobbyists working in their attic, spending their, their nights and weekends, um, you know, Building, you know, building the code, and you know, the reality is, it's 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 a great deal more more complex than that. I mean, if I were a big company, I'm not sure that I would want to be using software libraries that were primarily somebody's hobby or somebody's you know night nights and weekends project. Um, you know, preferably, uh, you know, the software would be produced with a high degree of professionalism. So, this gets to the question of you know, you have open source projects, but who paid for it? Um, and so I'm going to put that paid in, in, in quotations. So there are many ways that, that software might be paid for. Uh, in, in the case of open source, uh, a lot of, and I have a little bit of data on this in the presentation, but a, a lot of open source software is paid out of people's free time. So 
you know, free time isn't exactly free. So if I take, um, you know, a half of a day or, or a day to work on an open source project, even if no one is paying me, like that, that work is being paid for out of, out of my time and an opportunity cost. Um, I could be spending my time doing something else, which um, I might make, make some money for. And so even if I choose to spend my time on an open source project, that work isn't free. It's I'm, I'm paying for, for the work um, in, in effect. And who, who pays for, for, uh, for projects? Uh, you know, one of the biggest divides is when you think about how projects are, are led and how, how they are governed. Um, and I, you know, many projects, fall, they, they straddle the two kinds of, of major projects, but, you know, the two, two buckets that I spend a lot of time thinking about are projects that are led by industry or that have single, um, single corporate sponsors um, or projects that are primarily uh, driven by the community that are, are led by a, a distributed network of, uh, of individuals um, around, around the world. So, so just to give you an idea of, um, you know, kind of industry projects and, and community-led projects. So, in the case of in the case of industry-led projects, often these are, you know, the, the, this is software um, that was created at a company that was open sourced. Um, open sourced later. Sometimes you have a code base that wasn't uh, created to be an open source project to begin with, and it was it gets open sourced later. And it turns out that open sourcing a project is a lot of work. And um, sometimes companies will choose not to open source something, even if they could, because it's a huge, the, the amount of work to take something from an internal code base that works on your infrastructure to something that will work, um, you know, that can be used, let's say, on all three, you know, all three major operating systems and deployed in a variety of settings. Um, you know, just in the case of Pandas, as an example, if we only needed to use Pandas on Linux, it would save the developers a lot of time. Let's say Linux and Python 3. So just supporting you know, two flavors of Python and three operating systems creates a lot of extra work for us. And if we were working in a single company, we wouldn't necessarily need to do all of that, do all of that work. So some examples of industry-led projects are things you might have heard of, like TensorFlow, which is created by Google, uh, the Swift programming language, which was created recently by Apple, um, the Rust programming language. I think Rust is now community governed, but it's created originally by and open sourced by, uh, by Mozilla. Community-led projects are, are more complicated. Uh, sometimes they're, they're started by um, ambitious individuals, um, you know, or a collection of, you know, developers get together and decide uh, to launch a project. They may not be affiliated with uh, with any particular company. Sometimes community-led projects will be led by a group of companies getting together and deciding to work together, but where no single company um, essentially controls, controls the project. So one, one part of this is, you know, when you look at, there are so many open source projects out there, and what motivates developers to create high quality High quality software. So, if you are, if you're building a, if you're building a project for your own purposes, you have the motivation that you make high quality software because you want it to work for your particular use case and your business. If the code has a lot of bugs and it, it uh, you know, has a lot of problems, maybe you'll get fired. So you're motivated to like not, you know, not get fired. But in the case of, of, of you know, open source projects, in particular, community projects. Um, the incentives for producing high quality software can be a lot more uh, complicated. So you care about things like, um, will people take us seriously? So maybe if, if people don't take you seriously, they might look at your software and say, well, these developers that are making this library, they aren't very good, so we need to solve this problem, so we're going to start a new project, or we're going to fork that code base and, and ignore those developers. And you do see that. That, that kind of thing happen. And I know, I know that I spend time worrying, and a lot of open source developers do worry about giving people the impression that the software they are producing uh, is high quality, um, even if they, you know, they're, they aren't directly, if, if bad things, 
if something bad happens to the project, it won't always negatively impact the, the developers directly. So open source has also become really important, um, you know, kind of as I was saying before around, you know, around trust and transparency. Um, and this idea of, of software freedom and being able to not have, you know, not have vendor lock-in and being able to walk away from, uh, you know, walk away from a collaboration or walk away from a company that you're working with uh, on a project. Um, you know, I think in the past, like people have experienced all of the problems that come, that come with vendor lock-in and open source has given them a way out of that. So a variety of problems can occur in, um, in these different types of projects. So some of the, the issues that I, I've seen and other people have seen in, in corporate-led projects is some, you know, when you have a project that's being led or driven by a single company, sometimes that company might change their strategy um, or they, they might have a, a, you know, some, something related to their business, how their business is doing. And so they might either stop working on the project or take the, the engineers that were working on the project and assign them to, to a new project. And so when you think about like how, like who's paying for a project, so if people are, you know, if the developers of, pro of an open source project are being paid by, paid by a company, um, there's the risk that, you know, their, their boss might say, well, you can't work on that open source project anymore. We need your skills and time to work on, uh, to work on something else. Um, sometimes the, Sometimes projects are produced by startups. So I've seen this happen many times where there's a promising open source project that's developed by a startup, and then either that startup fails, uh, or it gets acquired, or, or, or it pivots. So in each of those cases, you could have a situation where suddenly um, the developers of, of, that, of that project are no longer able to continue, to continue so supporting it, which leaves the users in a bit in, in a bit of a bind. So this is not to say that community projects are not without, you know, not without their, uh, not without their problems. So uh, sometimes in community-led projects, process, progress can be a little bit slower because it takes a longer time to make decisions. So when you have a single company making all of the decisions and, and effectively owning the project, they, sometimes it can move faster. In community-led projects, um, you know, maybe it takes more time to build consensus about major changes in the project. Consensus can also be good, which I'll, I'll say a few words about later. Um, but I find that the developers of community-led community projects, because often a much larger proportion of their time is spent, uh, is, is unpaid time or, or time that they're taking out of, out of their lives, that the developers are much more prone to, uh, to burnout um, and you know, essentially burn out and, and leaving leaving the project or having to take time off from the project. And I have I've experienced you know burnout in my own in my own work. And I know many uh, many open source developers have have struggled for years uh, with burnout, keeping up with the demands of uh, keeping the user community um, healthy, healthy and happy. Sometimes developers are if they're working on the project in their free time. Uh, they might get a new uh, full-time job or, you know, uh, they might have a new consulting project that they need to pay their bills that prevents them from working on, uh, from working on the project. Another more insidious uh, problem that I see in, in community projects is that there can often be an underinvestment uh, in, in testing, in packaging, and uh, continuous deployment. And so some of the issues that you have with poor testing or poor uh, development infrastructure um, it may take a while to present themselves, um, and really, it ultimately makes the the development community less productive because you don't have as many of those that support infrastructure for running a uh, successful successful project. So there was a uh, a numfocus. So numfocus is a nonprofit organization uh, in the United States uh, for for funding. Um, Projects like, like Pandas, um, so it, it provides a way for, for organizations to give money to NumPy, to Matplotlib, to Pandas, to many other, many other open source projects. I don't know if you can read this, but there was a slide in, I, can, I should look up who actually, whose presentation this was, but um, they looked at three major, 
projects in the Python ecosystem, the Pandas project, NumPy, and Matplotlib, they looked at how much, you know, how many times have these been downloaded approximately, how much did these projects cost to build in terms of people time, how many contributors do they have, um, and then ultimately how many project maintainers are keeping the project running. So, um, so I don't know if you if you've spent if you know the difference between uh, con project contributors and project maintainers. So the maintainers are typically the core developers who are responsible for all of the flow of code and changes into the project. So contributors might open pull requests on GitHub, but it's the maintainers that give code review that decide whether a patch or a pull request is good enough and gets merged into the code base. And so, you know, Pandas has has approximately four maintainers. Uh, NumPy has approximately six. Matplotlib has five. And so, so the tweet that um, uh, you know ab about it was that you know there's 15 people who are essentially making these these three open source projects that we all depend on work, which is sort of terrifying. Um, and most of the and I and I know at least in the case of Pandas that most of the the time that is spent uh, by the maintainers is volunteer time. And so it's it's kind of a terrifying situation when you consider how important Pandas has become to the uh, to the community. So there can also be um, you know toxic relationships between the user bases and, and the developers. Like I find that that open source users often uh, grow a sense of um, you know, often grow a sense of entitlement, or they feel like, um, you know, that by using that project that they're owed something by the, by the developers, uh, the developers of it. And so I actually had an email thread one time where a Pandas uh, user uh, described uh, himself as a uh, customer of, of the project. And so, uh, you know, I had to sort of chew on the word customer for a little while, and I was like, well, I... I, the check must have gotten lost in the mail, uh, and it's a surprisingly common common view that that people f invest their time in using a project and they feel that the developers developers owe them. And I'm not, you know, much quite sure how true that is. So there's a number of myths that that surround open source projects. So one of them is this idea of um, organic growth, so the idea that, you know, essentially open source software springs forth from, from the ground, and if a project doesn't solve, um, doesn't do what, 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 what you need, or doesn't have the features that you need, that one solution is, is simply to make the feature requests and, and to wait, and hope that um, kind of as organic growth proceeds, that, you know, someone, someone in the world will build the things, um, things that you need. Another myth that I, I hear is the, the idea that um, that developer burnout is not really a problem, that um, essentially, you know, it, it's there's 7 billion people in the world, and a certain percentage of people will be interested in building open source projects. And so if the maintainers of big open source projects burn out, then as a result of that random process, other people will show up and pick up the, pick up the slack from them. Um, I'm not sure how true that is because if, you know, you came to work on an open source project where a bunch of maintainers or developers had burned out, you would probably know and it might, you know, give you pause whether you choose to get involved in that project. So if developers burn out, it can make a project significantly weaker. Um, and kind of along these lines, this idea that, you know, I think a lot of businesses, people think about engineers as replaceable as replaceable parts. So, you know, if one, you know, essentially, if, uh, you know, if somebody gets transferred off a project, we can find somebody on short, you know, on short term to uh, kind of take their place and take up the reins uh, of developing a project. But, you know, the reality is, you know, a lot of open source maintainers carry so much uh, project history and knowledge uh, in, in their heads that it would take um, it could take an individual, um, you know, months or, or years to develop the level of uh, project knowledge to be effective as a, as a project maintainer. So I'm always impressed with uh, Jeff Reback and, and other Pandas maintainers who seem to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the, you know, Pandas issue tracker, which has had, you know, uh, 12 or 14,000 issues. And, you know, Jeff will often, you know, an issue comes up and he'll 
21,316. Um, somehow he just has all the numbers memorized. It's, it's pretty impressive. So there have been some surveys run about how open source development is funding. Um, so there's a, a, a startup that's working on open source economics called Tidelift, and they found that the two most significant sources of funding for open source, um, the number one is self-funding, so no funding. So essentially, you are paying for the project indirectly with your time. And, um, and the second most is from employer time. And if you think about it, both of these both of these sources of funding are very vulnerable. So um, if you, you know, at some point you need to make money or you may, you know, something may change in your life where you're not able to spend, you know, I have people with families and children. Uh, I don't have any children, but if I did have children, I, I would be much harder for me to spend time working on open source. Um, but think circumstances change in people's lives, and so that, that top one could go away really quickly. Um, and employer support, can can also be unreliable as the as you know businesses do change over time and their ability to to give people the time and space to work on to work on open source. Um, the work is also split between uh, maintenance and innovation. I think people tend to understand the idea of building of building new stuff. So people like it when you build new projects. When pandas came around, I think. People were really excited that they could read they could read CSV files now, and I think that probably pandas is killer app is its read CSV function. Um, if I could say if I could cite one thing that made the project successful, it would be it would be that. And so when when companies think about paying for open source, they like the idea of innovation because they're you're building new things that weren't that weren't there before. But projects also need to be maintained, and I find that communicating. You know, if trying to explain to people um, all of the work that goes into maintaining a large and complex open source project, um, particularly for business people, it, it it can be hard to it can be hard to explain. So, in the case of pandas, like just explaining, you know, uh, trying to summarize the last 1,000 issues that were closed, or the last 5,000 issues, the kinds of bugs and problems that come up are so difficult to understand if you aren't working every day inside the code base. And so just that difficulty in explaining all of the time and effort that goes into building the project makes it even harder to convince people to, get, to give um, financial support to do the work. Because it's easy to say, okay, this money is buying me a new feature that I didn't have before. Um, and so you know, the same amount of money might be harder to get to, to maintain the project exactly as it is now. So there was a um, so there was a report. Um, so so a woman named Nadia Egbal wrote a report called "Roads and Bridges: The Unseen Labor Behind Our Digital Infrastructure" uh, a few years ago, and it centered on some um, high-profile problems in open source projects like the Heartbleed vulnerability in, in OpenSSL uh, to essentially shed light on the kinds of problems that um, that 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 can impact businesses caused by open source, open source maintenance problems. So I encourage you to, to check that out and learn more about that. So I'd like to take my last few minutes to um, you know, talk about why I think community, even though community-led open source projects have a lot of problems, why do they, why do they matter and, and why, should you, why should you care? So for me, the biggest, um, you know, um, one of the reasons I like community-led projects is that there are fewer single points of failure. So you aren't dependent on a single company to continue to support that project. So I find that the community can be a, a great deal more robust, and they work hard. And, and as a result of that, you know, distributed nature of of how uh, the project functions, the developers are more incentivized to recruit new maintainers and new contributors into the project. And so if you're just if you're working inside a company, you have an employment relationship with you know with your with your you know, your boss or your management chain around building that project, and so you may not be as motivated to recruit new new developers for the project. Um, community projects often function, um, make decisions based on uh, consensus, and they often document those decisions on public channels, and so it gives greater transparency to um, people who are using the project, who are in the community, so they can see how the, how the project works and how they can get involved 
and gain influence in the project. Um, influence is often gained by doing work, which is also a very good feature that if you want to influence the direction of the project, you can, um, you, you can gain karma, gain a say in how the project works by, by contributing. Um, open source developers often fall into a number of traps that make it, um, you know, to, to try to finance, try to finance their work. So I think the three, the three biggest traps that I see, uh, one is starting a, great, so I've got 10 minutes to go. So one of, the, one of the traps that people fall into is starting companies. So doing a startup to support the project. Um, there's a number of problems that can happen there. I mean, one of the biggest ones, because uh, I've, I've lived in Silicon Valley, I, I've had a, a venture-backed startup. Uh, startups can create conflicts between the desires of the startup founders and its employees and, and the demands of their, uh, of their investors. And so sometimes a, a company will start an open source project and then as time goes on, they come under more pressure to, make, you know, to, to monetize and to become profitable and the time that they're able to spend on the, on the open source project may, may dry up or may shift to uh, proprietary software that is built on on the open source project, and that ultimately harms the can harm the, the user the user community. Sometimes developers are uh, sponsored by uh, have a single corporate sponsor or work in inside a uh, a big company that uses the project. Um, you know, as I've been been talking about, this also poses the risk that um, that they might get transferred to a new project, um, or that the company might um, you know their budget for supporting that project may, uh, may change. Another, another trap that I've personally experienced is doing consulting to support, uh, support yourself. So you find somebody who uses a, an open source library, you strike up a consulting project with them, and you use the money that you make from the consulting project to, to, um, to you know, give you time to, to work, on, uh, work, on, work on open source. And so this is, this can be problematic because you end up caught up in, in the hustle of getting contracts and supporting yourself. And the consulting project is often using the open source software to solve a business problem, not developing the project itself. And so, um, so I've, I've, I've seen plenty of developers start doing consulting and find that they you know, are only able to spend 20% of their time doing open source development, which is, which is too bad. So just thinking about community-led projects, in the last few years, I've gotten involved in the Apache Software Foundation, which is a, a, a nonprofit or organization in, in the US that has developed um, a governance framework for, for open source projects that are uh, community-oriented. And so, um, the, 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 so the Apache Foundation, also known as the ASF, does not pay for open source development work. Um, but it provides us cultural norms for uh, to, to to guide projects and how they should how they should function and how they can build healthy uh, developer communities. So some of the things I've been talking about this idea that decisions should be made on the basis of consensus, um, that decision making power should derive from merit and contributions um, to the project, um, that decisions and, and communications in the project should be open and transparent and viewable by anyone uh, anyone on, on the internet. So I've become a big fan of, uh, of the ASF and a lot of my work uh, nowadays is, is uh, happening in Apache projects because I believe that the um, kind of culture of Apache projects uh, is very effective at creating healthy and robust developer communities. So the question is, community-led projects are difficult. So what happens if you know, 10 or 20 years from now, um, developers by and large find that it's, they're too difficult and um, we should just focus on projects that are uh, you know, created by Google or Facebook or Microsoft or, or, or so forth. And there is that, that risk that um, if users lose trust in projects that are community-managed that don't have a you know, a, a huge uh, tech company behind them, they might, you know, stop using those projects and say, well, if the project, if the code isn't produced by Google, we don't want to use it, or 
you know, a, a company that's of the size or influence, um, you know, of Google. So there's a um, there was a movie that, that came out over 20 years ago called called Demolition Man uh, that's set in the future, and uh, I guess as the result of some things that happen, all all the restaurants in the world are Taco Bell, and so there's like a joke in the movie. It's like you know now all restaurants are Taco Bell, so maybe you know that's one possible you know bad thing that could happen in the future. It's you know maybe the only effective open source or the only successful open source projects are projects coming from the 10 largest tech companies in the world. I would find that to be, um, to be pretty sad. So I don't have a great deal of answers. I, I, I think these are, you know, I've been doing open source for a really long time. And uh, so these are the things that I think about because I want to see healthy communities develop um, for, you know, the users. To, to be productive and um, for the projects to innovate and become you know better than they are now. I think we've come a great a long way over the last 10 years. And 10 years from now, I, I would like to look back on today and say, wow, things have gotten much, you know, we've come so far in the last 10 years. And I think these um, sort of funding and support uh, issues um, are make th making things a lot, making things a lot harder. So, so the two, um, two big ways to help open source projects, either you or, or your companies, or, um, you know, so one way is giving time. So contributing in all the different ways that you can contribute to open source projects, whether uh, contributing code or writing documentation, answering questions on Stack Overflow, uh, you know, doing code reviews, um, you know, kind of all of that, all of that stuff. Um, if you, if you have the ability to to give to give money, um, you know, a little bit a little bit goes a long way. Like I think if you know if everyone, um, you know, if everyone gave, if every Pandas user gave, uh, you know, one dollar per year, and I'm sure that we all, you know, we get one dollar uh, a year of, um, I guess it's what 30, 32 bot. So maybe we get, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, give it to me. You can give it to the project. But you know, I think. If you think about like how much value you get out of these projects, you say, well, sure, I would give I would give a dollar, but you know, even you know, it, it would if we wanted to collect a dollar from everyone, it, even it would even be complicated to do that. But if everyone did give a dollar, um, that would be a lot of a lot of money and could al allow uh, a lot of people to spend work full time working on uh, working on pandas. So uh, so every so every every little bit every little bit helps. Um, to help with, uh, you know, raising money for, for open source development um, and, and the projects that I, that I care about. So I recently, um, I, I've just uh, um, created a new organization called, uh, called Ursa Labs. And uh, so this was a couple of months ago, so I'm just, just getting started. So uh, over the last few years, I've been working on an open source project called Apache Arrow, which you can read more about on the internet, but the basic idea is that we're building uh, shared infrastructure for data science to make projects like um, Pandas faster and more and more scalable. Um, we're building libraries that can be used in many different programming languages. So, you know, Python, we're working on, we'll, we'll be building R bindings for, for Arrow. Uh, we've got JavaScript and Rust and Ruby and C and Java and, you know, there's, there's a ton of stuff happening. So. Um, so we're raising money to, to hire full-time open source developers for Apache Arrow. Uh, the, the team is embedded within, within RStudio, which is a, a company that's um, which is interesting. It's a, an R-based R company, but we formed an alliance uh, to, uh, to, to build infrastructure for, for data science. So one thing I, I often, you know, when I talk to people about, you know, giving time or money to open source projects, it helps to have success stories. And, um, you know, generally um, only good things happen when, when projects get, in my experience, only good things happen when projects get funded. Um, you know, the most common case is that projects don't get funded and so you never get to see what might have been. So just as an example, um, someone I know in the Python community uh, Nathaniel Smith, he's uh, he's done a lot of work on statistical uh, computing in Python. 
If any of you use stats models or the Patsy project, he created Patsy and has been involved in stats models and, and many, other, uh, many other projects. Um, but Nathaniel was, was funded by um, the Berkeley Institute for, for Data Science in California for two years. So a single person funded for, for two years and he was able to undertake, um, you know, for, uh, you know, work full time on um, scientific projects for Python, and he had four, you know, four big projects, and was able to make, you know, a huge impact as a single as a single individual. And so it's, uh, you know, when you hear about, you know, individuals making so much impact, you know, I I, I think about what it might be like if we had, you know, the ability to fund ten times as many people or a hundred times as many people to dedicate their efforts to making the the software better. Uh, so I think we'll we'll get there eventually. Thank you for so thank you for your attention. Um, so I hope this gives you some things to think about, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, you know to working with all of you over the the coming years to build uh, to build better better software for data science. Thank you. <laughs>